Okay, so our latest prediction for the second and third fire signs of 1 Kings 18, which precipitate World War Three, actually, are Heshvan 4 to 6, either side of Heshvan 5, which is the fourth Zohar Pentecost, and that's October 13, 14, 15, 16, today being October 8. And that's for the second fire sign, and the third fire sign is Heshvan 20 or 21. Heshvan 21 is the 2 NC Pentecost, and that is October 29, 30, 31. So, middle of this month and end of this month are our new predictions for fire signs, and they must occur at Pentecosts. So, we have the third one at the 2 NC Pentecost, and we have the second one at the fourth Zohar Pentecost. And these fire signs are either side of the inauguration of Solomon's Temple, which must occur during Booths, but God makes a provision for a late festival in the midst of the first regular festival, so Booths is not only Tishri 15 to 21, but also Heshvan 15 to 21 if you don't manage to do it in Tishri. So that's the last opportunity this year in our present understanding to inaugurate Solomon's Temple. So it must be inaugurated, because, and we, we're not a year out in present chronology, because events are moving too fast towards the mark of the beast. So it must be inaugurated from the 15th to 21st of Heshvan. And what that means is at the end of the inauguration, the third fire sign occurs, and that would be the cloud accepting the temple. When Solomon built his temple, God sent fire to consume the bull before the inauguration, and he sent a cloud into the sanctuary at the end of the inauguration, which prevented the priests doing their work. So the fire signs straddle the inauguration. Because the fire came from the heavens to consume the bull, that was a sacrifice for Solomon's temple prior to the inauguration, back in 1026, uh, Tishri 15 to 21 BC, and then the cloud filled it on Tishri 21. And the same thing pretty much happens in the antitypical temple of Solomon, which must be installed in the ark, because the temple is built on the threshing floor of Ornan or Aruna, and Aruna means chest or ark. So we build the temple in the ark. I mean, this is the exciting thing. And now I'm talking about a, a non-nuclear, just a, basically a terrorist attack of some type, one producing a mushroom cloud, we don't think it's a nuclear mushroom cloud, it might be a dirty bomb but not a proper nuclear bomb, above the Hudson in Manhattan, that's the second fire sign, and another one, the third fire sign produces one above the Thames near Dartford, east of London, and these attacks, actually the second fire sign in particular, precipitates World War Three, which begins, we now think, on Heshvan 18, three days before the third fire sign, which would be when Britain would then join in. The reason we put the, the, the American fire sign before the British is that World War Three begins between the two fire signs and I don't think an attack on Britain would instigate World War Three, but an attack on America might. Now when you're a church that predicts things that don't happen, I mean we've predicted I think 700 times that there'll be these fire signs and we got it wrong all 700 times so far. And that gives us very, very little, well, it gives us lots, actually, of negative credibility. And when you say oh, we're all going to be raptured into an ark, that probably gives you even less credibility and status. So I want to talk a bit about status and credibility, seeing as I'm uh, the leading expert in having none of either. And this church is. Because I want to turn it into something positive. Most viewers might think of status as a positive thing. I want to say lack of status is positive when it comes to Christianity because Jesus did not choose the perfumed Pharisees of Jerusalem to spread his divine wisdom throughout mankind. He chose the smelly fishermen of Galilee who had no status at all in the eyes of your urban Jerusalemite. In fact, the only apostle Jesus chose who didn't come from Galilee was Judas, who betrayed him, Judas Iscariot. Likewise, God chose to send his 
angelic son Michael to redeem mankind who'd, who who was already constructively a god under test to be a god and had already fixed the first Holy Spirit and was about to pass his test to become the second god in the entire universe. He's the first created God, the first creation, the first son of God to become a god which is what God says when he's men means when he says today I've become your father you are my son I mean to become a son of God you have to actually be a God uh, because like begets like in the world of nature when it's not interfered with by man and in in the world created by God through actually through Satan initially so he sent him to Israel and he came as we know, to be born in a cattle ship, which is hardly a silver spoon in his mouth. He wasn't a Roman citizen like Paul. He wasn't in the preeminent administrative race, the preeminent world power of the day. He was a nobody in a nobody country, and the people he chose to represent him were nobodies in terms of worldly status. And yet, these nobodies had more wisdom. What does the scripture say? They were men ordinary and unlettered. And they had more wisdom and more understanding of God's plan than did the extraordinary and lettered members of the Sanhedrin. Some of whom, few, were humble enough to recognise that. But most didn't. So my plea to the viewer, of which one day there will be millions if not billions, is to judge everything on its merit, not on the status of the person telling you the information. Because mankind is stumbling and has stumbled, and by mankind I mean womankind as well, more so by status. Status of kings, status of governments, status of large media outlets, status of international reputable organizations all forms of status even academic status but God operates through people who have negative status and always has I mean not exclusively there is a scripture where I think Paul was quite heartened and uh, by the fact that some of the Greek women of noble birth uh, joined up to his church and, you know, it's not the case that people who are successful and have high status don't have faith and can't join the church. But they generally are not chosen to lead the church. It's the guys who Satan rejects who God accepts. So the people who are nothing in the status of the world run by Caesar who has hitherto been saved, he's not anymore actually, you know, understanding is Jesus now, because we're in the kingdom of God run, as run by Jesus, but not yet in the kingdom of God as run by God. Jesus has to judge the sheep and the goats first. But bear in mind that Eve was fooled by Satan offering her the status of a God. You can decide for yourself right from wrong, just like the gods do, if you eat this fruit. And she fell for it because she was conned by status. Don't be naive. Do not be conned by status. Judge on merit of information, not on status of informer, if you want to know the truth. And as a golden rule, if something is being espoused or pushed or promoted by a, house, a high status outfit, I would give that less credibility than something that was being pushed by a low status outfit. Because one of the main advantages of status is it makes it easier to sell things to people because they believe because of your status and therefore it's easier to sell a lie or misinformation. So that would be the pattern of the way God's dealt with mankind and it couldn't be more obvious today in so many spheres. So I just wanted to point out that 
the incredible lack of status of this church is a kind of badge of honour, in a way, or makes it, but no, that's probably the wrong way to put it, it should not in any way lessen the divine status. Yeah, let us say divine status is diametrically opposed to human status, to your fame and fortune in this world is the precise opposite of your spiritual fame and fortune. Now, this is well known to a lot of Christians. But I must confess that this church has made a big mistake and it's mainly my mistake. We have hidden our light, which is very intense uh, in terms of very good doctrine, under the measuring basket of a failed chronology. When I say failed, it's not failed. Hitherto it's failed to produce a prediction that's convincing in anybody for the fire signs. But my background is computer programming and it took Microsoft 7,000 builds to build Windows 7 and it's taken me 700 builds to build our chronology based on decoding the scriptures rather than encoding C++. So what counts when you're doing encoding or decoding is are you getting closer to the target or further away? and looking at world events we are getting closer and our chronology is matching more closely to world events every week that passes. So two big big chronological predictions which we are relying on at the moment are first of all well let me put it like this all the major chronological scriptures used to deduce that Adam was born in 3993 Nisan 14 by which I mean the 430 years in Egypt the 480 years from the sons of Israel leaving Egypt to the starting of the building of Solomon's temple, the 400 years of affliction of Abraham's seed, uh, the 70 weeks of years, all the big chronological scriptures that are applied in the past to deduce the chronology back from Adam to Jesus, including the midst prophecy actually, all of those scriptures apply today in an end times application because the, the, the Bible is a living prophecy book as well as a dead history book. Most history books are just that, a dead history book. The Bible is a history book plus a living prophecy book. So all the numbers that applied back thousands of years ago apply today as well. And one in particular, the 430 years in Egypt. We take that a month for a day and it becomes 14 years and four months. And it runs from 2008 Nisan 14, which was the end of the 6,000 year lease of Michael over Adam, which he got for ransoming Adam runs for 14 years, 4 months to Ab 14, 2022, which is the absolute end of Adam, the end of the world, the end of everything. That's August 13, 14, 2022. That's when the last person passes or fails the kingdom test, and when the last kingdom failure is Passover executed. Uh, but but that such is the mercy of God, that, that and here, here we can destroy our credibility even further, such is the mercy of God that that the last month from Tammuz 14 to Ab 14, 2022, during that month, people with no faith at all in God, but only with love for their brother, people who do not by, in any respect obey the first law to love God with your whole heart, soul, and mind, and spirit, but only obey the second law, people who don't, are not interested at all in God, but nonetheless, see the advantage of looking, of caring for their brother and how that will make a society work. Those wise but unfaithful people will be saved by Jesus Christ, a guy who they do not accept. That is the love and wisdom and brilliance of God. And they will be resurrected uh, first fruits on Ab 21 and killed on Ab 14. So that's one of our big scriptures we're relying on. And if we get the date of the end right, Ab 14, that means our present short-term chronology, near-term chronology must be correct. If not, it, it, what we've had in the past is we've kept on having to move the end date forwards and forwards and forwards, but the scripture says to Daniel, go towards the end, and we've tried to do that, and we've tried to get the end, and we think we now have nailed it as being 430 years a month for a day after the end of the 6,000 year Lisa Michael. I mean we thought originally the end of the 6,000 year Lisa Michael, uh, Nissan 14, 2008, we thought that was the end. But we missed the whole time of the end after that. Which is the period of the seven fattened thin cows or 14 years in that case, which takes you to 2022 Nissan 14, then there's a final four months. So that's one proof. Now the other 
nice proof is the 400 years of Abraham, which is worded very, very specifically as all scriptures are. It says, you will be an alien resident in a land not yours, and you will serve them, and they will afflict you 400 years. Now, the Bible is distributive, so when it says you will serve them and they will afflict you 400 years, it means you will serve them 400 years and they will afflict you 400 years. And in the greater meaning, there are two fulfillments. One is on the First New Covenant saints who went into Laodicea, which is the seventh congregation of Revelation 3, which is the, an internal Lord's Witness church in the Watchtower, which nobody's ever heard of except people in it. They've kept it secret so well. So that gives me even less credibility. And the, the, the second presence began in that church, 2006, CR 14, when some First New Covenant saints joined it from the Watchtower. And if you go for 13 years and four months or 400 years a month for a day forward from that, you end up on Elul 2019, and that's when the third presence began. That's when um, the affliction of those one NCs by the Odyssea ended, and instead they were fated, they were identified, they entered into the marriage Passovers and died the death of the Christ, which is a, a death from which you don't go into Hades, but you get rescued from the gates of Hades. You're dead for either five or ten hours, and you end up back in the ark, resurrected into the ark, first of all angelically, and then as a human in the ark on the third day after you die, or actually at first fruits after you die. So they died actually on Tishri 14, 2019, and they were resurrected on Tishri 17, 2019, which was the third one in sea marriage. So that's a 400 years a month for a day, or 13 years, four months of affliction. And they went out with many goods, much wealth actually, the scripture says, in the form of an angelic body and getting married to Jesus and being part of the Holy Spirit. That's one fulfillment. Then there's a second fulfillment on the first Abrahamic covenant on the sons of Abraham. Not the saints, but on the faithful, the citizens of the kingdom, the ones with faith. And that runs from, starts the same time the 430 year starts, 2008 Nissan 14, or Nissan 21. I mean, it, it runs from the completion of the choosing of Abraham. And Abraham entrance into the 1 AC ended on Nissan 21, actually. And there's a further 195 days in the kingdom, but they didn't begin until this month sometime. So 400 years from the defining of Abraham, 2008, Nissan 21, a month for a day, which is 13 years and four months, to 2021, Ab 14, Ab 16, which is the first crop of the tree of Revelation 22, tree of life, which is the time when regular citizens, regular sons of the 1AC, who have been sealed into the FRC, who passed the test of faith, faith, ransom, covenant, that is, they become non-Adamic. So that is 400 years a month for a day before they become an alien resident. And the nation which they are serving, I shall judge, that is a nation of Adam. And Adam is about to be judged now. He's actually being judged right now and has been since Ab 2021. And what happened on the 14th to the 16th is they got a standing non-Adamic transformation from being Adamic to non-Adamic. They died to Adam and resurrected to non-Adamic Abraham without realising it. It's a standing resurrection. It's just a genetic gene zone, basically. You technically die in that you wake up in a body that wasn't the body you went to sleep in. So that's a death and a resurrection, but you don't notice it. So they've had this covert transformation to become non-Adamic. And there are 12 crops of the Tree of Life of Revelation 22, one a month. And so there's a year of this that, that occurs. Actually 12 crops is 11 months. And then the, the final crop, the 13th crop, isn't a crop of that tree. It's what I said before, it's the people without any faith at all. The last chance saloon guys, the unbelievable mercy of God. They get saved by the love, ransom, covenant in circumstances where they have no faith at all. But the, there's 400 months, or 13 years and 4 months, between the end of the world of Michael, which is the end of entrance into the 1 AC, First Abrahamic Covenant, 2008, Nissan 14 or 21, because they get an extra week of Daniel 9 f for the many. So 13 years, 4 months takes you to Ab 14, which is when the escape, when they become alien, they escape from Adam, when they become alien residents, 
when they're no longer in the nation which they're serving. So in the one case there's 400 years of being afflicted, in the other case there's 400 years before you become an alien resident. In, in the one case there's 400 years of being an alien resident and the other case there's 400 years until you become an alien resident. And this is a classic ambiguity the scriptures are full of when Jesus says a tetramenos and the harvest comes. It can mean a tetramenos during which the harvest comes or a tetramenos and then the harvest comes. And in fact it means both. And likewise with the 400 years of affliction it can be 400 years of affliction or 400 years and then affliction actually be either. So, it, but it's a big understanding if we have it correct, I think we do, that, that there's 13 years and four months between the end of Michael's lease and the beginning of the crops of the tree of Revelation, which is 400 years a month for a date before Abraham becomes an alien resident. Because when you're non Adamic, you're an alien, you're a foreigner to Adam, you're not part of his nation anymore. Whilst you're Adamic, you're part of the nation of Adam, all his sons. But when you're non-Adamic, you're no longer in that nation, so you then become a foreigner. So as so long as that's right, it means that the 12 crops end on actually Tammuz 14, 2022, 20, and then there's one more month to the final crop of, as I say, those without faith but with love. So those are the two, are two of the big prophecies we use to convince ourselves that the absolute end of Adam is uh, 2022 uh, Ab 14, which is August 13, 14, 2022. Thank you very much.